start a new series. I'm excited to preach this series. God spoke this to me in my own devotional time. He was speaking this. This came out of that time. And can I just be honest with you? It is out of those times when I'm spending time with the Lord, not with an agenda to get a message, but just genuinely spending time with him. When he speaks to me, that's where the best messages come. Those are, those are the messages that come that it's not me, it's not any creativity that I, it's just Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's what I would call revelation when it comes from him. And I'm excited this morning to start a new series called Different. Everybody say different. And maybe some of you in here, maybe you are a little different, you know. Don't nudge your neighbor on that one, okay. Uh, may, maybe you got some different stuff about you. I don't know about you, but when you, if, if you're married in the room, when you got married, you learned really quickly that your spouse is different than you. You know what I'm talking about? They're really different than you. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how many different people we have in here, but what I want to talk about in this series is the fact that we are meant as believers, as Christians, as born-again believers, to be different. We are meant to stand out of the crowd. We are meant to live differently. We're meant to believe differently, think differently, and have a difference about us that people should notice the difference about us. And notice that I didn't say we're meant to be weird, okay? There's some weird Christians out there. Nobody in this room or nobody watching online, but there's some weird Christians out there. You know who I'm talking about, right? We're not meant to be weird, but we're meant to be different. We're meant to, when we go to work, when we live our lives, for people to say, listen, listen I, maybe I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something different about that person. There's something different about him. There's something different about her. But I think so often we try to blend in. We try to um, conform, a biblical word there, conform. We try to, I, I don't necessarily want to st stand out. I don't want to make waves. I don't want to, I, I don't want to uh, be different. I don't, I, I'm, I'm cool with being like everybody else. I just want to be successful. I just want to tuck my head in and, and go for it. But listen, as believers, we're called to be different. We're called to be different. The Bible, listen to me, is full of instruction about being different. Full of instruction about being, being different. It says it different ways. Romans chapter 12, it says, Do not be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't, don't be conformed to the way everybody else is doing it. Don't be conformed to the belief system of the world. Listen, you're, you're meant to get your opinions, you're meant to get your belief, you're meant to get how you view the world from God, not from everybody else, not the world systems. John 17, 14 says, we're not meant to, we are not of this world. We're not of this world. A lot of us watching, a lot of us in the room maybe know what it means to be an alien or an expat in another country. Some of you have lived in other countries, many countries you've lived in. You, listen, listen. The same way as believers, we are not meant to be of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world, as maybe you've heard it said before. James chapter 4 says, listen, anyone who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. When you're a friend of the systems, when it talks about the world, and the Bible is talking about a system. It's not talking about the earth. The, it's talking about the system and the ways of the world. It's talking about the, the culture of the world, the sin nature of the world. We are not meant to be friends with the world. We're not meant to buddy up with the system of the world and conform in that way. We're meant to be different. And so throughout this series, my hope is what we can grasp is that we can learn and we can be challenged afresh to live differently. And wherever, whatever, your, whatever your daily grind is, whatever you do on a weekly basis, you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a college university student, you work in the corporate world, you go and work a, 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 a job, whatever it may be, that whatever we're doing, we do it with a different attitude, with a different heart, with a different mindset, we live differently. And throughout this series, I hope to equip, I hope to challenge all of us to live differently. I'm excited next week. Pastor Liam is going to be with us joining in on this series, Different. If you don't know Pastor Liam, he's the lead pastor of Europe, Destiny Europe, and we're excited that he would come up from Rosenheim to be with us next week. So get ready. 
we're diving into different. Everybody say it one more time, different. I remember when I first gave my life to Jesus, it was this really, ten- it was this tension of, man, I, I, I'm meant to live this way. I'm reading, I'm reading the Bible and I'm learning how to think differently. I'm learning how to live differently. It wasn't an overnight change, but God was speaking to me about my lifestyle and I was beginning to live differently. But what I began to notice was it's now the people that I'm around, the people I go to work with, the people that I, ha- that I was a fr- friends with, they're different than me. I'm living different than them. I remember there was this season in ministry, Megan and I, my wife, were youth pastors, and it was kind of that season of our life when everybody, it happened to be like Megan's friend circle from high school, all of them were getting married, and none of them, most of them were not believers, None of them went to church. None of them were involved. They, they, they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know how to live that lifestyle. But they knew Megan, and they saw on social media that the, the girl that they went to high school with has a pastor for a husband. And so when they came up against, hey, we're getting married, who should marry us? They said, hey, we should get the young pastor who's friends with the girl we went to high school with. There was like this season, that I think every weekend I was doing a wedding. I was like the wedding guy, you know? It was crazy. And so I was going from wedding to wedding. I remember so significantly, what I'd like to do at weddings is, um, I would go to the, I would go to the groom, and you know, in the, whatever room they have, the grooms, they're getting ready, you know, they're doing this, and they're talking, and you know, they have their different rituals and things like that. What I like to do before the actual ceremony is I like to go to the groom and say, and with all the, with all the groomsmen, uh, I, I like to say, hey guys, can we just, can we pray? Because marriage is a, it's a, it's a holy moment. It's a, it's a biblical contract that's taking place. It's a, uh, it's a covenant that's taking place. I said, hey, this is a big decision. Let's pray. Let's believe God. Let's bless your marriage as the leader of the home, as the husband of the home. Let's believe and let's get your friends to pray with you. Well, when I started doing these weddings, it was real awkward because they didn't probably ever pray before. You know, they're like, yeah, sure. So it was like this really awkward moment. I'd go in there, guys, can we, just, can we just pray over him? They didn't know what to do. You know, as Christians, we know like, oh, we're going to lay hands on him or we're going to bow our heads. They're like, they, they have no idea what to do. I remember one time I go to the, to the groom. I say, guys, can we, can we pray? But right before that, they were talking about what grooms talk about before they get married. They were talking about the bachelor party the night before. And so here I am feeling so awkward, feeling so different, because the bachelor party the night before was the farthest thing from sanctified I've ever heard. I can't even repeat what happened at the bachelor party but in this room. And I I felt so awkward. I'm like, I don't even, should I even pray now, you know? Like, what, what am I supposed to do here? We did pray, but man, I felt so different. Maybe some of you in this room, you go to work, you go to different areas, you've got friends, you've got a circle of influence around you that there's times when there's conversations going on. There's times when there's certain lifestyles being lived that you feel so different. Maybe that you used to feel different and now you've just joined in it and, you ha- and to them you don't look any different. And they're asking the question, well, they go to church, they believe in God, what makes, them, what makes them different than me? They do the exact same things. They talk the same way we do. This is why we're called to be different. We're called to be different. The Bible has, has characters in it that we're going to study that are different. In fact, in fact they didn't, the characters in the Bible didn't make it in the Bible by being average and by being normal. They didn't get recorded in history because they were normal. Noah didn't get recorded in history because he said, you know what, nobody else is building a boat, I think I won't build a boat. Everybody else is saying I'm crazy, the weather report is it's not gonna rain, so I don't know if I'm gonna build a boat. No, Noah was excommunicated, he was different. There's people in the Bible who are so different. They live differently. And the one I wanna zero in on today, his name is David. David was different. David was different. You know, you know the David who killed Goliath with a sling and a stone. You know the David, right, that was the, the shepherd boy. He was tending the sheep. He had eight brothers. Uh, he was eight, one of eight brothers, and he was actually left out in the field when Samuel came to look for the next king. They thought, David's definitely not the king. He's different. 
let's leave him tending the flock. David was different. David was different. David was the David was the giant slater. You know, you, you watch sports and they talk about, oh, this is a David and Goliath match. You know, this is the, the little guy versus the big guy. He was, he was different. He was different. He was, a, he was a worshiper. In fact, he was different than so many different characters and his surroundings in the Bible. I want to read to you really quickly an excerpt out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, this is the story Right when when David is about to kill Goliath. We read a lot about David up until this point when Samuel the prophet comes to anoint him king. He was anointed, went right back to tending the flock. Then David began to serve and Saul, who was the king at the time, began to serve in his kingdom. And any time this evil spirit, any time that Saul was troubled, David would play an instrument with the, the lyre for him because he was a great musician. He learned it in the, while he was a shepherd. He learned it in the field. And now David is about to face Goliath. And I want to read because I'm going to introduce the title of the message today. This is where God spoke to me. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephraite named Jesse who was from Bethlehem. I don't don't know anybody else from Bethlehem in the Bible, do you? He was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul into war. They were in war with the Philistines. Goliath was a Philistine. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadad, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. Do we have any youngest watching online? Do we have any youngest children, only children? Maybe you're you're always left out. He was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But watch this. This is where God spoke to me. But David went back and forth from Saul to tent his father's sheep at Bethlehem. David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's sheep. The three oldest sons were in the battle. They were on the battle lines. But the whole reason that David ended up fighting Goliath in the first place is he was bringing food from Jesse, his dad, to the oldest sons when he heard about this giant Philistine who was challenging everyone, and no one would fight him. No one would fight Goliath. And then here David is coming now from the field where he was tending the sheep to deliver food to the battle, to the fight where his brothers were hearing that Goliath was on the scene challenging them and all they had to do is defeat this one guy and the Philistines would surrender. But nobody would do it. I want to talk to you out of the subject today from the field to the fight. From the field to the fight. Listen to me, the fight for me, this represents your daily grind. This represents the job that you go to. This represents the area of life that you're working to progress. This represents the fight you have trying to raise your kids. Can I get an amen? This represents the, 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 the daily act. You see, in the Bible, the Philistines represent the world, represent the systems of this world. And... And David, instead of being like the rest of the soldiers, constantly in the fight, well, none of them fought, they just stood there in fear, David would go from the field where he was tending his father's sheep to the fight. You see, the field represents the place of intimacy. This represents that place of devotion with God. The field, it represents that place, your relationship with God, the time that you spend with God. The field represents the place where God trains you up, where God speaks to you, where you hear his voice. It represents the time that you plug on the worship music and you go on a run and you go on a walk. It represents that time in the morning, maybe for some of you, where you sit down and open up the Bible or you read that devotional and you say, God, speak to me. The field represents that place. And what I see in Scripture is the thing that that was different about David was the field. The field was different. 
And it shows up in many different areas of his life. First of all, he was, he was different than anybody else in the Bible. David was the only one that the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. God said, doesn't say this about anyone else in the Bible. David was different. He was a man after God's own heart. And do you know where he learned that? He learned that in the field. He learned that when he was tending the sheep. He learned that when he was sitting there watching the sheep eat grass like he had done from day to day, hour to hour, and he was playing the lyre, and he was singing songs to the Lord. He learned it in the field. 1 Samuel 13, 14 says that God looks for a man after God's own heart. He's going to anoint a king that's after God's own heart. And then the moment in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when David is out tending the sheep and his brother, the prophet Samuel has come. Now I'm going to anoint a king. He's going to be one of Jesse's sons. All the sons come before Samuel, the prophet. But God tells Samuel, this isn't him. This isn't the king. And he says, is there, any more ki- is there any more sons? Yeah, there's one. He's in the field. Say it with me. He's in the field. Okay. He's in the field. He's, he's different. He's the youngest. He's, he, he's different than all the rest. He's in the field. Bring him here. That's when Samuel anoints him king. Because then that's when God spoke to Samuel and said, listen, you've looked at all these. They look like kings. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, he says, listen, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God looks at your heart. You see, the, in, in the fight, it's all about the outward appearance. It's all about what everybody looks like. It's all about what, they, what you look like to your boss. It's all about what you look like to your colleagues. It's all about how people perceive you. But listen, that's not what God looks at. God looks in the field to see if there's anybody with a heart after him. It is your heart that sets you apart from everybody else. It's not about your actions. It's not about your behavior. It's your heart. If your heart is right, your behavior is right. If your heart is right, your action is right. That's why so many people have been deceived about Christianity. They say, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, well, then i gotta do, I got to do all these things, and I can't do all these things because that's no fun. I don't want to be a Christian. But what they don't know is, is when you give your life to Jesus, he transforms your heart, and it's those things that come later. Your heart sets you apart. We have to stop spending time Working on, our, working on our head, working on the outward appearance, and we got to let God develop our heart. The field develops your heart. It's the field that develops your heart. David's heart was developed in the field when he was all alone. When he was, when he was all alone and he was probably scared at some times and there was no street lights in the field, God was developing and shaping David's heart. Some of you have been lonely in this season. And you've been attempting so hard to not be lonely. But what if that's a field that God is developing your heart in? Because he wants to shape and purify your heart. we got to quit waxing the car and work on the engine. It's like when I took my car to get washed and then the, literally the next day, Megan drove it around and she said, it's stalling out, something's wrong, and I took it. I love, I love in Germany the car service here. He said, I said, this is what's happening. He said, five minutes, I'll fix it. I'm like, okay, cool. Five minutes, there was a weasel that ate the, ate the thing. Uh, it, it wasn't the exterior, it was the interior, but so many of us ignore the interior. We think, oh man, I'm just going to turn up the radio and ignore what's happening on the inside. I'm going to turn up the noise of my life and ignore what's happening inside my heart. I'm going to be around more people. I'm going to get more busy. I'm going to watch more Netflix. I'm just going to drown out whatever's going on around me, and I'm going to focus on the outside, but God is trying to develop the heart. David was different than his brothers. He had developed a heart in the field. He had developed a heart. He developed something that God was trying to do. He was different than his brothers. One after the other came before Samuel and said, this isn't the king, this isn't the king. Maybe he looks like a king, but he's not the king. There's still one in the field. There's still one in the field. Because the field, watch this, the field is where you find God's favor. The field is where you find God's favor. 
The anointing, see, David came before Samuel, and Samuel poured the anointing oil on him to say, you are now going to be the king. You know what that anointing oil meant? That anointing oil, now it means you are favored by God. The favor of God is on your life. So anybody, anytime you ever hear somebody's being, oh, they're anointed. Listen, you're, you, you're anointed. God can anoint you. God's favor can be on your life, but the anointing is developed. The favor is developed in the field. The favor's developed there. He was the only brother who was anointed, but he was also the only one that was in the field. Listen, the very thing that you feel like sets you back, David wasn't even invited to the party to become anointed king. The very thing that you felt isolates you, that sets you back, would use to say, no, 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 no. My favor is on this one. My hand is on this one. You thought everybody else ignored you. You thought that that thing set you apart, isolated you. Nobody wanted to be around you. Nobody wanted to be with you. You thought that thing, but that's the very thing and the very place that God would use to set you up and to set you apart. He was in the field. Just because, just because, watch, just because nobody else sees you doesn't mean God doesn't see you. You've been trying to get attention from, the, from your superior, and they, they're not paying attention. But somebody is. But he sees you in the field. He sees you where nobody else sees you. You, you, you have to understand that God's favor on your life is greater than anybody else's favor. I don't care who's in charge of the paycheck. God's favor is greater than their favor on your life. God, God's favor puts you in the front even when you feel like you're in the back. It's God's favor on your life. You've been praying. You've been seeking God. All along your colleagues, you've been praying, you've been seeking God. All along your colleagues have been prayer, preparing, they've been pre- preparing a keynote, they've been preparing uh, th- this idea and that idea, but you've been spending time praying and you're wondering, man, am I wasting my time doing this? No, 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 God's favor's on your life. You're in the field, you're working the field. Oh man, I keep serving and, and all my friends, I, I keep having these things with church and um, with outreach and that kind of, and my friends are going off and they're having fun and they're doing their thing and I'm serving. Oh, you're working the field. God sees you when somebody else doesn't see you. He was different than his brothers. He was also different than every other soldier. He, he went from the field to the fight, and all these soldiers are trembling with fear. They're saying, oh, no, we can't go fight Goliath. We can't, we're, we're not going to take him on. You see this guy? This guy's been trained at war. He's been trained to do this. He, he, he's going to kill anyone who comes up against us. We don't have a champion good enough to fight the Philistines' champion named Goliath. Every other soldier, even the king, Saul, was afraid. Nobody would take him on but David. David was different. David was different. Because the field gives you a different perspective of the fight. The field gives you a different perspective. If your head's always at work, if your head's always at, how do I fix this problem, how do I fix this problem? Your head's always in the fight. If your head's always in, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get this done? If your head's always in, what do my friends think about me? What do they think about me? Your head's always in the fight. And that's why I got to get to the field where God speaks to me and gives me a different perspective about the fight, where he speaks something different to me. You might be among the ranks. You might be the colleague. You might be the friend. You might be standing among the ranks like David was. David started to go around asking, hey, who's this Who's this giant? What is he saying? What is he doing? And they begin to answer. You might be among the ranks, but you're different. But you're different. And let me tell you, when you're among the ranks and you're different, don't be the Christian that tucks away and says, I'm going to be so different that I'm not going to be around anybody who doesn't know Jesus. I'm just going to shut down. No, i got to be. Man, get around some people who need Jesus, but they need to see that you live differently, that you think differently, that you have a different perspective when you get in the field 
when you begin to serve, when you begin to pray, when you begin to hear God's voice for your life, you begin to have a different perspective. You will see problems differently. I know everybody else is trying to solve the same problem that you're trying to solve. But God will give you an idea and you'll think it came out of nowhere, but it came from heaven because he's going to give you a different perspective. And they're going to say, what happened? Do you know anybody like peanut butter? Peanut butter came because a guy was spending time walking in the woods with the Lord. He said he started praying about a peanut. And he started coming up with ideas. God started giving him ideas what to do with peanuts. And now you have peanut butter. Thank you. So anytime you ever eat peanut butter, you just thank God. You will see problems differently. You'll see people differently. You see, you'll see, you'll see the, you'll see the person who was, you thought was your enemy. You'll see the person who you thought was not like you. You, you can never get along with them. You'll see people differently. And you'll see your purpose differently. Going to work won't just be going to work. You'll wake up and say, man, I got a purpose today. I'm different. I am the head, not the tail. I am above, not beneath. I got a purpose today. I'm going to show people Jesus by the way I think. I'm going to hear from God before I walk into a meeting. I'm going to hear from God on my walking on my way to the store. I'm going to hear from God today. I've got a purpose today. Going to the store is going to be different. I got a purpose today. I might just run into somebody that needs Jesus. I might just run into somebody who's desperate for him. I will see my purpose different. I don't have a, my my, my work isn't in this box and my purpose in this box. I have a purpose and it's what I'm about because I think differently. The field gives you a different perspective, doesn't it? It gives you a perspective of the fight. He was also different than Goliath. He had a lot of audio, obvious differences than Goliath. Goliath, was, he was obviously a giant. He was obviously a trained warrior. He carried a shield and a spear. He would go out for 40 days taunting the army of Israel saying, if anybody will take me on, anybody will take me on, we can end this right now. We can end this right now. What happens at Fight Club stays at Fight Club. Come on, bro. Who's in? Nobody. Until David steps on the scene because he's different. Because he's different. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. I need to read this to you. This is so good. It says this. But David said to Saul, now David's made up his mind. He's about to go fight Goliath. But David said to Saul, your servant, listen, your servant. Saul's like trying to talk him out of it. You're crazy. Don't do this. David said to him, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me, watch this. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Do you want to know where David learned how to kill a lion and where David learned how to kill a bear? In the field. It said, it says that, that Goliath was trained from childhood to fight. Ever since Goliath was a baby, he didn't have a rattle, he had a dagger. They were teaching this man how to fight so that he could become the champion of the Philistines. He was the best of the best. While the whole time, and and David was in the field from childhood, the whole time Goliath is learning the tactics of war, David is learning to trust God. Because when I trust God, it will always outweigh the tactics. Trust is greater than the tactics. Trust it, trusting in God. Listen, tactics change. 
We know this because Goliath, even though he was trained in war, he wasn't trained on how to take a shepherd boy with a sling and a stone. If, if David would have picked up the sword and picked up the shield, then he would have been done for. But Goliath wasn't trained in the tactics of guerrilla warfare. The tactics changed. But the tactics changed because there was a boy named David who trusted God and said, I trusted him with the sling and the stone against the lion. I trusted him with the sling and the stone against the bear. And I'm going to trust him against this big tall guy who has a bad breath and looks crazy. If if God did it then, he'll do it again. And trust will always outweigh. That's why the field will develop your faith for the fight. And your faith will always be greater than the tactics. Your faith will always be greater than, than than religion, than tradition. So many of us have grown up, this is the way it's done. This is the way we should do it. And we've we've bought into tradition and not into trust. And we're called to step out in faith, trusting God. If you do the, if you just be somebody who trusts God, people will notice that you're different. Guys, this is the way we've always done it. What do you mean? I don't know. I feel like God is telling me to do this. I know it's crazy. I know this isn't, I, I, I know it's a sling. I know it's a stone. That, that, that's, that's nuts. I mean, I'm pretty accurate, but, but I trust God. But I trust God. We've got to learn how to trust. And then later, I love, this is what I love about David. I'm just trying to show you David's character. David was different than Saul. You see, Saul was the king. David was anointed to be king, knew that he was going to be king, and worked for Saul. Then Saul got so jealous because David was a, became a warrior and started to kill more people than Saul. And everybody began to sing David's prayer. Look at David. He's killed his tens of thousands and Saul's killed his thousands. And Saul began to get jealous. Jealousy struck in. So he decided to kill David. So then David left the kingdom. Still not king yet. Being hunted down by the king. Hiding in caves. Running for his life. Still trusting God. You see, the cave wasn't any different than the field. David was alone again. David was rejected again. But but Saul was hunting him down. David had the opportunity. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, what is that next? What is that next one, Sam? Do you have that up there? 1 Samuel chapter 24. Saul comes into the cave. He came to the sheep pens, sorry, the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Saul is hunting David. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. David had the chance to kill Saul. But instead, he cut off a corner of his robe. And you know what? He felt bad about it. He felt convicted about it. About even cutting off this man's robe who was trying to hunt him down and kill him. Do you want to know why? Because the field will develop your character. The field develops your character. Your character is shaped in the field. Who you are when nobody else is looking. Who you are when you have the opportunity to get ahead. Who you are when you have the opportunity to win. But it's still a conviction from God that you ought to live this way. I'm telling you, God will develop your character in the field. God, God refines your character in the field before he ever reveals you. Before you're revealed to everybody, before David was king, he was refined in the field. Before they ever said, here's King David, he was in the field. Small beginnings will set your character up for big endings. You thought what you're doing right now is small. You thought what God put in your hands is small. 
Come on, Team Destiny, those people that are serving. You thought, man, playing that instrument, this is just small. You thought plugging in a, a microphone, this is just small. You thought, man, this job opportunity that I got, this is just small. You thought this opportunity I got to serve. You thought that you thought it was small, but small beginnings are what God uses to set you up for big endings. He refines you in the field. He develops your character there. Listen, if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. God is developing your character in that place of serving. I started to watch, I started going this YouTube um, rabbit hole, you know? You know what I'm talking about? And, and, of like uh, tier one, tier two uh, military teams, you know, like these like the Navy SEALs, Delta Force, and, uh, you know, all these, all these special forces. I started going, I'm like, I want to know what kind of gear they have and all this stuff. This is so cool, you know, because I was watching a, a Netflix show about Navy SEALs, so I thought, man, maybe I'll go down to YouTube. I want to know more, you know, so I started researching. I'm a nerd, I know, and I was watching one of these Navy SEALs who had been a Navy SEAL for, I think he said, 20 or 30 years, and they were asking him, they were interviewing him, they said, what made you want to be a Navy SEAL? He said, I, I, I enlisted in the Navy. I was on the boat that very first year I enlisted, and then some guys got on the boat who looked differently, that's how he said it, they look differently than everybody else. And he said, I don't know what it is, but I want to be what, they're, what they are. And he said, well, they're, they're SEALs. That's when he enlisted into, into the Navy SEAL training, into BUDS and all this. He, he said, I'm going to be a SEAL. You see, he saw that these guys were different. They looked differently even. They acted differently. They walked differently. There was something about them because they'd been in the field. They'd been, they'd been, they'd been refined. They'd been shaped. Every little thing, they've been moldable. They've been teachable so that they could survive in the fight. And I'm telling you, this is what God does in the field. And you'll be, if you wanna, if you wanna live differently than everybody else, then you gotta live differently than everybody else. You see what I'm saying? If you, we we, we like to look at everybody else, say, man, I wish, I wish I had that penthouse. I wish I had that car. I wish I, I wish I had that job. I wish I had that influence. I wish I had that gifting. And we wish a lot, but what we don't do is we don't decide, I'm going to live this way. They live differently. They train differently. They do different stuff to get a different result. If we're going to be different, we got to live different. God develops my character in the field. He develops my heart in the field, he he does, gives me different perspective in the field. I gotta if I'm gonna if I'm gonna live in the fight, I've got to go from the field to the fight. Uh, you find yourself, you find who God has created you to be. God reveals your identity in the field. It was in the quiet times, in the lonely times, that God began to speak. This is who you are, Daniel. This is who I've molded you and shaped you to be. You meet God and you find God in the field. Can you stand to your feet with me this morning, today? I believe God wants to speak to us. And he's going to challenge us the next couple weeks to live, think differently. And I want you to think about the context that you live in. The influences that you have. The people that you're surrounded by. And the first question you ought to ask yourself is... Do I actually stand out from them? Do I actually stand out from them? Or do I talk about the same things they talk about? Do I live the same way they live? And then you need to ask yourself, how has God wired me differently? How might I stand out? Not for the sake of standing out, but for being in the field with Him. You need to get to the field where God refines you. Can you close your eyes with me today? Maybe you're in here today and you've never had a relationship with God. Maybe you're watching online today and you've never made that decision to say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I'm going to step into the field where I have a relationship with God. I'm tired of living in the fight. I've walked away from God and I want to rededicate. I want to make a decision today not just to come to him, maybe to come back to him. Maybe you've walked away from him in different ways of your life. If you're in the room and that's you, all eyes closed, can you just lift a hand in the air and say, I'm coming to Jesus today for the first time or I'm coming back to him. See that hand, yes. If you're watching online today, there's going to be a 
I want to get you resources. If you're in the room and you made that decision, come see us. Come see us, and we want to give you resources as well. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. Let me pray that I could have a relationship with God again. You are the Lord of my life. It's not my will anymore. It's your will. I want to live for you. I may not know what that looks like, but I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live differently. I'm going to live with the hand of God upon my life. I'm going to live with a different perspective of my daily grind than everybody else. I'm going to stand when everybody else is sitting. I'm going to live differently. And God, for all of us today in the room or online, I pray that you would speak to us on how we might live differently. Speak to us in the field. Help us develop a field. Help us develop that place where we serve. Help us develop that place where we give our time. Help us develop that place where we spend time with you, where nobody else is looking, where nobody else is watching. Help us identify that place in our life and how you might speak to us. And the next coming weeks, God, you would speak to us afresh in the field and prepare us for the fight. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, can we give God a hand clap of praise today as Roland comes up? Amen. Amen. Thank you for that message. Thank you very much. You know, if we set time apart to build intimacy with God, our faith rises. That's pretty much what Daniel said. 